Today we are in 1 Timothy, the book of 1 Timothy, chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6, and we will read verses 17, 18, and 19. Because it's just three verses, why don't we read all three of those verses together? All right, so 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17, 18, 19. I still hear some pages flipping. All right, let's go ahead and ready, begin. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Verse 18, that they do good, and that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Verse 19, laying up in store for themselves against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. And let's pray. Lord, again, we thank you so much for the privilege that we have to be here this morning to be with your people. We thank you for a great, great start to the summer here at Pacific Baptist Church for all that's gone on, the fellowship, the soul winning, the preaching, and just all we've been able to do with your people. Thank you so much for our church. Thank you for our pastor. Uh, please be with him as he preaches to us, all of us, as we listen. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. Timothy chapter 6. We are in our stewardship uh, through uh, July, our little stewardship campaign, 
And what we've been talking, 1 Timothy chapter 6 has been talking primarily uh, about our proper understanding of finances. Can I get a little more on the, on the monitors, please? Our, our, our proper understanding of finances and riches. The problem that we have in our lives um, usually comes because we don't have a right, a right perspective on things. And so uh, in Timothy, he's trying to get our perspective corrected. The first week when we looked at the first few verses of 1 Timothy, he explained to us what real riches really are. And real riches have nothing to do with our checkbook. It has nothing to do with, with where we live, how much money we have in our pocket. Uh, real riches have to do with two things. Uh, godliness, how we live for the Lord, and contentment. Are we happy with that which God has provided for us? Last week, we talked a little about the love of money, which is a wrong attitude, which brings a lot of problems in our life. Uh, people that struggle with debt, primarily we struggle with debt because we have a, a love of money. We've, we feel that money will bring us, uh, the possessions that money can buy will bring us happiness and joy in our life. And so when we don't have that money, we're willing to extend ourselves and put ourselves into a bad financial ground by, by getting ourselves into crippling debt. But we looked last week at what the antidote was for the love of money. This week, we're just looking at three verses here, and he's going to talk to us directly about those who are rich. Now, by way of reference back to our message a couple weeks ago, um, we live in a prosperous country. The poorest of us in our, in our, our nation would probably be considered the richest, the richest people in, um, in most of the other countries. Uh, countries of this world, okay? See, w our, just our perspective's different, you know? We drive an older car, it's, we, we like, well, I drive an older car. Do you know most people in most countries don't even have cars? Yeah. Why well, live in a smaller house, and maybe I don't really like the neighborhood as well. That would be considered a great neighborhood to the majority of people that live on this globe. Yeah. And so in a sense, we are rich and prosperous. We heard the stories, I don't know, I think it was Brother Esposito when he was here at our missions conference of so those young ladies that will go and work 12 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, just to have their basic need met, needs met and the needs of their families. That kind of puts things in perspective for us. We are a prosperous nation. And as such, we need to know how to act properly. No matter what level we are at on our prosperity ladder, there are always going to be risk and responsibilities that come with that. So we come to these last few verses in, Paul, in chapter number 6. Paul instructs Timothy to charge, to give a, a, a challenge, a commandment to those who are prosperous. Now, I don't want us to look at these verses and say, well, I'm not rich. By the way, we, we, I've, I've mentioned the, the, the study many years ago where uh, everybody thinks they're, nobody thinks they're rich. They ask people, what would it take for you to believe that you're well taken care of, financially fit, and everybody to a person took whatever their income level was, and that, the amount they gave was double that. What does that tell us? Number one, we're, we're a very discontent society. Number two, none of us consider ourselves to be rich. But in the eyes of the world, you know, we, have a, we talk about this immigration thing going on. Why does everybody want to come to this country? Because they consider this a country where their dream can be fulfilled. So he's going to talk to us about that. There are many, many uh, planes that we live on in this world. You know, we can be rich in this world and we can be poor in the next. We can be poor in this world and we can be rich in the next. We can be poor in this world and we can be poor in the next. And we can be rich in this world and we can be rich in the next world. It's up to us. The key phrase when he talks about charge or challenge them that are rich in this world. We have to understand that, that everything that we have in this world is temporal, right? Uh, the illustration we've heard before is if you play the game of Monopoly, the, the, the game of Monopoly is cutthroat. 
The goal is to get everything, evict everybody, and send everybody to bankruptcy, right? Isn't that the goal of the game? And man, you sit there and you buy and sell pros properties and, and you collect your money and you don't, you pass go, you get $200 and all that, and you're going and going. And let's just, and by the way, that game can take a long time. And let's just say you win. I'm the winner. You know what happens after you win? You collect all the $500 bills and you put them in this slot. You collect all the 100, you put them in that slot, 50s, 20s, 10s, 5s, and 1s, and then you, you close up the board, you take, if you could be the boot, or you can be the car, and you put it all away, and you put the lid on the box, and you put the box away, and your fantasy world is over. It all goes back in the box, right? That's kind of what it is with the things of this life. And so we need to have the proper mindset when it comes to how do we relate to the blessings and the prosperity that God gives us. Well, there's an eight-fold charge or challenge that Paul gives, and I'm going to give you all eight. And I realize it's a little late, and I'm not spending a lot of time on all of them. We're going to go through this. This is Paul's challenge or charge to the prosperous, and that would include all of us. First of all, he tells us that we are to retain humility. Retain humility. Uh, verse 17, read it. It says, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not, what's that word? High-minded. High-minded is proud. Listen, just because we have a couple dollars in our pocket, just because we have a little bit more than maybe somebody else gives us no right to think that we are better than anybody else. The thing that really is repulsive about riches, a person, the more money they have, is their disconnect from reality. I love our politicians, and I love our idiotic sports and, 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 and actors who, who they, 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 uh, they get into politics for all this stuff, stuff that doesn't even relate to them. They go back to their gated community. Okay? But we get this attitude. I'm better. Now, we won't say that, of course. No one is going to say that, but we act like it. High-minded. Where does this attitude come from? Well, it comes as a result of thinking that our money is ours in the first place. See, everything we have, we have because God has allowed us to have that. If you don't understand that, you could get yourself in a lot of trouble. Because just, as, just, just the time we think we got everything figured out, we don't need God, God just kind of pulls the rug out from underneath us. You see, if you're saved, you're God's child. And God's relating with you. And he's trying to teach you lessons. And one of the lessons he's trying to teach you is you're not the sole supplier of your money. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be praised for working hard. You should. And I think God blesses diligence. But to be honest with you, where did you even get the energy to be diligent? It comes from God. And so let's not be high-minded. Let's not be proud. God hates proud, pride because it takes you directly away from him. One reason we get proud is because we find our identity in our money and in our possessions. That's what makes us proud. Yeah. See? I'm only as good as the purse I carry. Well, I don't carry a purse. He does. Okay? I'm only as good as the, the number. And, and, and our identity is wrapped up in our job position and how much money we have. And when our identity is going to be put into that, of course we're going to be proud. Because then we're taking the credit for everything. I read a couple quotes recently. This man said, There is no better indicator of the identity you have assigned to yourself than the way you use your money. The way you use your money shows what you think about yourself. That's why some people wouldn't give. You've got to hoard it. Instead of realizing, maybe God's blessed me so I can be a blessing to somebody else. You and I, over and over, are going to make clear who we think we are by the way we use our money. Number two. 
They, we have to um, resist trusting. Continue on in verse 17. Nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. It would do us good to remember that it is God that does the providing in the first place. Let me remind you of the Lord's Prayer. The disciples said, came to the, the, Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so he gave them an outline. You're not supposed to pray the Lord's Prayer per, verbatim. That's, that's vain repetition. But God gave us an outline of the things we should pray for. And here's what he says. Um, and he said unto them, When you pray, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, as in, so in earth. Give us this day our daily bread. Now I don't know about you, we'll probably get something to eat. On Sundays it's busy, we stop and maybe grab something. But if we didn't, I know there's food in our refrigerator. Uh, now some of it's old and it's growing hair, but we have stuff in there. Okay? So why in the world would I get down on my knees and say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread? Well, there's a couple reasons, I think. The first thing is to remember who gave it to us. And to remember who's going to continually provide for us. If not, we start to trust in uncertain riches. Just, let me ask, who would you rather trust in? The living God or uncertain riches? Let, let's say you're going to cross a lake in wintertime in Canada, which I suggest you don't go there in the winter. And the lake is frozen over, and maybe the ice is an inch thick. Maybe you can get through it. Maybe not. I would rather cross over the concrete bridge. Yeah. You with me? Yeah. We trust in riches, but riches are uncertain. The dynamics always change. Yes, sir. You have a great job, and you could get fired in a heartbeat. Yep. I gave the story. We had a guy at work, and uh, I was loading trucks at overnight transportation when I was in Bible college, and I was on the loading dock, and there was a guy there, and, and the, the, the main terminal was in Gaffey, South Carolina, and he got, this guy went to Bible college with, he got a letter from Gaffney, South Carolina, and, and they posted on the board where all the employees would see it. And the president of the company had been down there inspecting the Gaffey, and he loaded the truck that went to Gaffey, and he noticed how it was loaded, and said, and he wrote a letter, said, I don't know who, who, does, who loads a truck coming to Gaffney. They're first class. They're, they're great. All this praise for him. And we read the letter, and I saw him. He came to me. He goes, did you see the letter that they sent me? And he was joking around, and he was a good employee. A week and a half later, he got fired. He was loading the truck, and he was using a forklift, and he, and he, and he, uh, and he speared an oil barrel. And that whole trip to South Carolina, that oil spread everywhere and ruined everything. He was getting praise one week, two weeks earlier, and two weeks later he was on the unemployment line. Riches are like that, aren't they? Yeah. And so, what are we going to trust in? He says, look, if God's blessed you with any amount of prosperity, don't trust in the prosperity, trust in, and I love this word, the living God. He's not just God. He's the living God. He's not dead. He is alive. Let's remain trusting. You have two, two choices. Are you going to trust in something which is uncertain, which the majority of the people on this earth trust in? Or are you going to trust in something that is as certain as, as can be? The living God. The most serious money problem anybody can have it's not a debt problem. You know what it really is? It's a worship problem. If we don't trust in God, we're trusting in uncertain riches, yes. then in essence, we are worshiping the money. Yes, sir. That's what we're doing. We think the biggest problem with money is debt. I believe the biggest problem with money is worship. Yep. What is worship? Worship is when we give attributes to money which are only supposed to be given to God. Where does our security come from, God? Yep. Well, I was trusting in money. You're in for a fall. Yep. Addressing the issue of money and understanding money problems does not begin with money and budget. Really, it begins with surrender. Will we surrender those attributes to God or are we going to trust in money? 
Number three, let's receive thankfully. I like this. Who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Now we understand contentment's important, but let me just say something. Sometimes in Christianity, especially our type of Christianity, you know, we think that enjoying something is wrong. You know, being happy is wrong. The little phrase that they used to hear, you know, God doesn't care about your happiness, he cares about your holiness. So if I live right, I'm not going to be happy? Of course I am. And, and we can, look, everything God gives us, we ought to be thankful for because he's given it to us so we can enjoy it. Now, not in a selfish way. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes let's not fly off to the other handle. Okay? God's given you something. Be thankful for it. And so often we forget those, that type of thing and that type of mentality. Thank God for everything he's given to us. Yes, let's understand there are people less fortunate than us. Yes, let's understand and be involved with helping others. But be thankful for everything that God has given you. Yeah. You know, you don't sit down at your meal and say, well, God provided me this meal and I can't be happy. Man, dig in. Well, thank God for it, but get at it. Okay? If God gives you steak instead of like, you know, salad or kale, I don't know where this whole worship of kale is from. Now, kale is okay. I can eat kale, but it's got to be mixed with something really good. Right? Okay? And just like, if you give me a plate of kale, it's like, I don't know, I want to go fishing. I don't even know what that means. But just put a steak with it, I'm good. Okay? But whatever it is, thank God for it. What happens when we start to be prosperous and we think it's us, you know what we do? We're not thanking God. We're starting to take the credit for ourselves. If we're going to be humble, we better thank God and receive it thankfully. Amen. Let's hit the rubber, hit the road here. Let's react righteously. Look at verse 18. Here we go. That they do good. It's just, I like that. It's just like you speak a little kid. Just do good. Don't be bad. Let's do good. What does good mean? Act rightly. Sometimes we think because we have money, rules don't apply to us. And I understand everybody's the exemption to the rule, right? We all think, we're, well, that rule's for somebody else. That's not for me. I mean, after all, you know, uh, I know everybody in, in the line should get, you know, I drive home on the freeway and it's right in traffic time and, and you get in the lane and then there's, it's not a lane, it's, and people just drive illegally. And I'm like, oh, so you're so much more important than anybody else. Okay? But we all feel that way about ourselves. But the more we have, it just seems I can live any way I want. Fact of the matter is, if you're a Christian, the more God blesses you, the better we should live. No, you can't buy yourself out of it. You know, well, after all, Lord, you know, I, I, I gave. Give, but live right too. Let's not think that just because, just because we have money, we do whatever we want. The prodigal son did that. What happened to him? Lived at home with his dad. Everything was well. And then he got this mentality, I want my inheritance now. And he got his inheritance, and the Bible tells us he went out and he wasted his money on riotous living. Once he got a little bit of money, he thought, now the restraints are off. I can do whatever it is I want. You get these teenagers, you know, boy, they love God and everything and, and giving, and that's all good is, until they get a job, until they start making money. And still they have the means to kind of, if they want, go do their own thing. Well, that just reveals what was inside them in the whole time. Listen, let's do right. I don't care where you are on the financial scale, you're to live right. You're to do good. He also mentions, number five, richly serving. Look at That they be rich in good works. You know what good works is? Serving. Getting involved in ministry. Doing something for the Lord. You want to be rich? Don't just be rich in money. Be rich, as he says, in good works. Well, you know, uh, I, I, I just tied to the church. I'm not going to help. I don't need to go out on Tuesday nights, you know, because I give to help buy the tracks. Good. Take those tracks you're given to help us buy and get a handful and go give somebody one. Okay? 
Well, I'm going to help the new building. Good, and when we get in there, help serve in that new building. Okay? Listen, you are not above working in the nursery. I'm not, well, I'm not going to work in the nursery. That's not a good thing. Okay, ladies, you work in the nursery. We'll do other things. Look, what, what is, you know, we're going to have a work day. Uh, I can't do that. Why not? You know, uh, if the story Brother Gibbs gave about a guy that was a, a millionaire, and he was at the church vacuuming. Well, I bought the vacuums. Amen. Then you ought to know how they work. Okay, it's like, but all I'm saying is, all of us should be involved. It doesn't matter who we are. Let's all, just, let's all get after it. Richly serving. Next, resourcefully circulate. I like this. Ready to distribute. Distribute. Distributing is meeting the needs of others with our own resources. I like Galatians 6.10. As we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now, I'm not saying, you know, it seems like all the bus kids think that you're an ATM machine. And sometimes I'll give them a dollar. One, it was a little girl, her. She, she came, she was on Sunday night, and I'm like, I saw her for the first time. Oh, you came on the bus. I'm like, great. I'm like, I'm like hey, I'll tell you what. If you are here next week, I'll give you a buck. I forgot all about it, Brother Charles, until she came up next, Wednesday, next Sunday night. She goes, I'm here. Like, man, I'm glad you're here. She goes, where's my dollar? And I'm like, you know what? You're right. I promised you a dollar. I gave her a dollar. She goes, my friend's here tonight. And I'm like, you need to be here next week, sister, and I'll give you a dollar. And now it, periodically she'll, she'll see me and say, hey, I'm here again. I'm like, thank you for coming. I'm giving you a dollar every time you come to church. I'll go broke. Okay? Now, we're not talking about that, but we're talking about, you know, sometimes God will prompt you to help somebody. Follow it. Follow it. And I know we don't like to do it because we've been burned by somebody that maybe used it wrong or whatever, but let's not be hard-hearted. And the next one goes along with we resourcefully recirculate. Take what we give and don't just hang on to it. Help others. Number seven, let's be readily sharing. Willing to communicate. Sharing with others. Giving to, this is giving to, to, our, to our God through the church because of the relationship that we have with others. It's a social type of giving. Okay, you know, we all enjoy church. By the way, when it gets warm, we, we appreciate the air conditioning. Do you know that we don't have somebody outside with a crankshaft keeping the air conditioner going? Yeah. There's no one on a bicycle with a, with a we, we have to pay for that electricity, okay? But there's needs, and we give to that. We'll talk about that more later. And then lastly, let's rethink wealth. Let's rethink wealth. Look at verse 19. Laying up in store for ourselves a good foundation against the time to come that, that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, that's not talking about living to get eternal life. That's like living in such a way that we are giving and our money are seen. We're getting hold of eternity and eternal life. We're looking at eternity when we're thinking about our finances. In other words, the way we look and invest on this earth is, is seen through the lens of eternity. Rethinking our wealth. Our wealth is not simply just for right here. God gives us our wealth to invest eternally. We all like investments, don't we? Uh, if you heard of a good investment that's going to give you a 50-fold return, we'd get involved in that, wouldn't we? And some have. I remember many, many, many years ago when the internet boom was coming on, I saw a story and they were talking about the early days of the Amazon employees. And they, these people were working seven days, I was going to say eight days a week, that's not true. They were working seven days a week and, and, and just, it was crazy. They were getting the company off the ground. One thing they were giving them was stock options. They were giving them thousands and thousands of stock options for a quarter apiece. Do you know the first day those stocks went on the market, they were like $170? Every quarter they invested in a stock was worth 170 bucks. Instantly, most all the employees in the early days were millionaires. Now, we're all thinking, man, I wish I'd have got in on that, right? How many of you would like to get in on that? I know a better investment, investing in eternity. You, you know, we always say, you can't take it with you when you die. It's not happening. Your wife's new husband's going to get it, all right? Make sure you live in such a way that he doesn't get a lot. You know, or someone says, you know, they died, the, the, he, the, the father died, and their kids are all at the will, you know, and wondering what they were going to get. And, he's, and he says, I, being of a sound mind, spent it all, okay? 
you're not getting a penny. But you know, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot take it with us, but we can send it on ahead. When we invest in the things that God wants us to invest in. Some, sometimes we get so caught up and we start to get a little bit of money that, boy, we want to hoard it. God says, hey, I'm giving it to you to use for eternity. I know there's going to be rich people. When they, get to, they may be saved and they get to heaven, they're going to, they're going to be, heaven's going to be great for everybody. Don't get me wrong. But they're not going to be very rich in heaven. Because no. they all wanted to live with it on this earth. So what's the point? The point is this. All of us are blessed. All of us are blessed. But let's make sure that we don't let what we have have us. Okay? Let's make sure we follow God's precepts here in this way. Let's all stand together this morning, if we can, just for a minute.